grasping the thin, almost translucent veil between that of fact and fiction, revealing mysteries of the past, folklore passed down from father to son, unsolved murders, and things that go bump in the night. You've entered Deceptive Reality. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Deceptive Reality Podcast. My name is Nick, and with me tonight is the elf Sheen Bert. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it's a weird one. This one, uh, it remind- Christmas is over, Nick. I'm not an elf no more. <laughs> Elves have other lives. To- oh. They have other stuff to do, too. I thought they was only like- around at Christmas time, Nick. No, no, they're like stealing gold from dragons and oh. fighting orc armies the rest of the year. Oh, that makes perfect sense. Legolas. <laughs> there you go. So <laughs> what what do we know about Legolas? He's a master uh, archer, but I guarantee that's not what you were referring to. Uh, no, Elf Sheen is a beautiful man. Is it true? There you go. Is it true? See, they're always complimentary. Always complimentary. Oh, I thought that, I thought that's what you meant about Legolas. Oh, well, Elf Sheen means that. Oh, you call me. Oh, Nick. Yeah, yeah. Man, See, it's not even Valentine's Day. I know. I do not celebrate <laughs> that day. <laughs> man, oh, man, oh, man, Nick. We've had a lot of stuff going on here the last few. Uh, we are. Uh, yeah. We're ahead. We're a little ahead. This, according to our clapper, this episode is coming out. On the twelfth of January, so a bunch of the, a bunch of things has passed since we're actually doing this. We just mm-hmm. listened to anyone. You're not going to appreciate this. We just listened to the first ten minutes of the Christmas special, which would have already be long out at this point. If you've not listened uh, to the Christmas episode, you, even though it's not Christmas, you need to go back and listen to it. Yeah, it's gonna knock your stripy elf socks off. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> I honestly think so far that's going to be our best work once it's done. Oh, yeah. Yeah, guaranteed. It'll be this right is, next to the Halloween one, I think. I think it might exceed the Halloween. Oh, wow. From Blast an from auditory standpoint. Okay. Auditory. Okay. We'll see. We'll see. I think the Halloween episode will be cooler because it wasn't our work it was other people's work on that most right right but from an auditory only because we've learned so much i've learned so much about the auditory thing which is going to be nick which also you guys are probably wondering what this metal thing is it's still here (laughs) because we're still recording the christmas special and it's going to be here until the christmas special actually i may just keep it going forward who knows um it's not disruptive it's not hurting anyone yeah I mean, okay, it's totally it's fine. A little disruptive. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's going to be here for a little while, at least till we get through this part of it anyway. Um, yeah. But last week we did your episode, which was Jeff the Mongoose. Yeah. Talking Mongoose. That part's important. Sorry. Jeff the Talking Mongoose, which that was right. our first and hopefully our last Cursed episode. If you've not seen that one, you yes. need to go back and watch that one also. We barely That's if survived. it goes out. At this point, we don't, we don't even know if the episode's going to make it or not. We haven't uh, even tried yeah. to edit that one yet. Oh, uh, it was so bad. That was a nightmare. A nightmare. Which if you go back and you see there's a Jeff the Talking Mongoose on our channel called The Cursed Episode, we was able to get it out. If not... Ignore this part of our podcast. Yeah, pre- pretend you didn't hear anything about this. <laughs> exactly. But we did your episode last week, and mm-hmm. I'm going to be honest. My week, I had one 95% done, which is an awesome, an awesome mystery, unsolved mystery. Oh, yeah. It was a, But I listened to yours, and Jeff, the story of Jeff the Talking Mongoose, and this one, has one thing in common. And I didn't want to say it when I was I was on yours because I'm like, I'm gonna give away mine. <laughs> but Jeff the talking mongoose, I think we laughed through the entire episode. Oh yeah. He's he's a good funny guy. He's a good funny guy. Good old guy. funny. 
listen, sometimes you got to have a little fun in life, Nick. And that's yeah, exactly what chuckle. Jeff was all about. Yeah, he brightened our lives except for almost <laughs> destroying them. <laughs> well, I was sitting there and I was thinking we had those really, what's the word I'm looking for? A very um, uh, complex episode, very deep. Yep. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, man, then we laughed really hard with yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jeff was like the ginger that comes with sushi <laughs> refreshes your palate. <laughs> exactly. And I said, for anyone that doesn't know, my podcasts are really dark. Like it's all paranormal stuff. And if you notice all of you on YouTube, I got my, my paranormal shirt on. You got that ghost life on. Yeah, I do. And this episode, uh, because I've been playing around with some of the ghost stuff, works out perfectly because this one might have something to do with a ghost, Nick. Oh, a ghost, a spooky, a fun ghost, a good guy ghost. No, no, no. not a good no. guy ghost. We we can't. Dang. My goal, my goal in this, Nick, for anyone listening, <laughs> is to make someone Peter Pants just a little bit. Well, you've already won. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> this uh this is probably the most well-known haunting i i would say you know enfield was really big because of the uh mm. news reporting around it but anyone yeah. in the paranormal circle that loves paranormal stories this is like a staple or a pillar of must know ghost stories all right. All right. And it kind of mixes in a whole bunch of different realms also. Mm, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. The million dollar question is, are you ready to at least know what we're talking about? Everyone else knows because they saw the title, but you don't know, Nick. <laughs> uh, that's always so unfair. I'm always the last to know. <laughs> but, yeah. I want to know. I want to know now. <laughs> Here we go, Nick. In the heart of Tennessee, nestled among the rolling hills and peaceful farmlands, lies a mystery that has echoed through the ages. A tale so chilling, it has become a legend whispered in the quiet nights of the American South. A story of a family, an unexplained presence, and events so mysterious they defy explanation. In the early 19th century, there was a farm where life was simple. The days were filled with hard work, and nights were for rest. But, as we know, looks can be deceiving, and under this tranquil facade lay a secret that would soon terrify a family and bewilder all who heard its tale. This is not just a story of ghostly whispers or fleeting shadows. What happened here was far more unsettling. Imagine, if you will, a peaceful home turned into a stage for the inexplicable. Objects moving on their own, sounds with no source, and a family caught in the grip of something unseen. But what was it that lurked in the shadows of this seemingly ordinary place? What could turn a home into a haunt, peace into terror, and skepticism into belief? The answer to these questions lies in a name, a name that has become synonymous with one of the most famous hauntings in American folklore. Prepare yourselves as we delve into the story of the Bell Witch, a tale of ghostly creatures, poltergeist activity, and a haunting that has stood the test of time. Oh, yeah, I do know it. I do. <laughs> do you this know is probably... the moment? Uh-huh. The, the moment I knew what it was, and I don't know why I made this connection. As soon as I heard a sheep go, Ma, I'm like, oh, this is the Bell Witch. <laughs> and the sheep gave it away, I, Nick. I have no idea how I made that connection from that. <laughs> well, this is iconically probably one of the biggest... I'm going to say paranormal stories that I can mm. think of. And a lot of you is probably like, how can it be haunting? Uh, and you're saying entity uh, or paranormal. And it's simply because this one is so crazy of a story. Mm. And there's so there's two, th three things that make this story amazing. And I'm sure you uh, already know what they are. I'm not going to say anything about it, but mm -hmm. one of those three things, I'm sure of what it is, and it's the only story of a ghost in North America where this has ever happened. No. 
I no. think I know what you're talking about, but it's not. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Well. We'll see. Yes. We can't I think say, I know we what can't you're talking say about. it. We can't, we can't say, say it. it. We can't. It's too soon. Right. It's too soon. We don't want to. We don't also, want to finish off early. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> correct. Which I think to a degree. There's going to we're going to go into some different things that we've went into before that we've never went into with a paranormal story, which will make this okay. interesting. Um, now, how long ago has it been? Since the last time you read anything on the Bell Witch? Uh, it's it's been a few years. Um, I, I do find it interesting that all these. Stories are like we're always like. It started in a farmhouse. <laughs> I, I, I guess that's the only house that existed years ago. They're all farmhouses. So that's why we keep saying that if anyone's wondering, because it all started in a farmhouse. Well, a lot <laughs> of these big stories we've been covering as older ones also. Right. Now, for the record, there's still that property there, and they still say there's hauntings that occur there. But in addition to a- that... Uh huh. Is it a historic site now? Do they like have it preserved like that? I want to say yes, but I'm also researching another case on my podcast channel. Right. And I might be thinking that one. I can't remember. I think it is this one though. Now what makes this one interesting is it's called the bell, Witch. I'm sure a lot of people's like Hmm. thought we was talking about a ghost story here. And without diving too deep into it, there's a young lady that we're going to cover. Well, I don't know how young she was. She was a little older, but uh, in the very next segment, it's going to go into who it is. But there was a woman that was thought to be a witch. And that's where all of this kind of came from. Right. Witches die. Don't forget. They can become ghosts. In fact, I think they would be more likely because <laughs> they got some some yeah some voodoo Witch, kind of action business. going. Yeah, some they got witchy business, business to do. <laughs> this one's always intrigued me because of the one thing I think we're both talking about. I think in so. my mind, there's only three cases that I can think of in my head where that's a thing in North America. Because I, I know a lot of people say this is the only one of this in North America, but I'm sure there's maybe, more. I'm sure there's more. There's one that I know of that they don't attribute to this. We got to be so maybe. careful right now. We got to be so yeah. careful. <laughs> We're riding a fine line right now. Yeah, let's not talk about this at all. This part at all. Let's wait till it happens. Now, the crazy thing is in this story, and again, we're going to cover, I'm, I tried to encompass as much and I cut as much fluff as I can out, but I still like to build the story a little bit. So mm-hmm. there's a lot with this one. There's a lot of uh, what they consider. Well, let's back up. I think the most important thing about this story is that believers and skeptics both find this story extremely interesting. Hmm. And skeptics find it interesting because there's one person that talked about this that is probably the most important person in U.S. history that confirmed it. Oh, really? Did you know about that part? I don't think I did. Maybe it will ring a bell when I hear it. A bell witch. Uh, But I don't remember it off the top of my head. (laughs) Yeah. Is there's one extremely important person is like, yep, nope, that exists. And, uh, you know, of course, in every single one of these podcasts, we talk about proof, other people seeing it. And mm. Jeff, the Mon- uh, talking mongoose prime example, when he was yeah. going around to all of his locations, people was hearing the conversation. They knew what was going on. Mm-hmm. And, uh, this is kind of the same idea. Like, uh, More than just the family heard it. And we're going to go into some of that too. But the, it'd be like a celebrity coming today 
a big time celebrity coming today and acknowledging a haunting, right? Like now the haunting locate the haunted locations we've got now, celebrity paranormal people go there and go, right, yeah, right. that's haunted. But there's not like a big name that goes there and is like, yep, that's haunted. That's the number yeah. two thing that makes this one different. Oh, there is a celebrity that likes to go around haunted stuff. And he's now? not a paranormal celebrity. Yeah. Like he's scared of it, but he likes to go near it. And it's the nicest guy in all of show business, Post Malone. He does. Actually, this is really interesting that. that you say that. He loves paranormal activity. You know who has a podcast right now, which no one believed it do this podcast, but also has a paranormal show. And I didn't know it until recently. Who? I've literally gotten hooked on it. Jack Osborne. Oh, I thought you were going to say Post Malone. I was going to leave this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Post Malone, don't do any podcasts. We can't lose no viewers. <laughs> ah, man, he, he's so nice. But Jack Osborne, he's a funny guy, too. He's a funny like, guy. Still don't he, leave. But <laughs> Well, here's the thing that's amazing about the whole Jack Osborne thing. And I didn't know this till recently. Mm -hmm. The family bought the rights to all their old television show. Oh, really? They're opening a media company now. Oh. And they're going to post their shows on that media company. And each one of the family members started their own podcast and then once a week, the family does their own podcast together. So Kelly, that Jack, awesome. Sharon, and Ozzy. Yes, I've been hooked. I think I've literally been wa binge watched all of them up to this point. And of course, Ozzy oh, wow. just sits there and he's like, uh, 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 Sharon, Sh Sharon. And I'm like, this is <laughs> the best podcast ever. But Jack has his can, own podcast around the paranormal. Can I tell you a story about Ozzy? Absolutely. So. A few years back, I went to see him in concert. Mm -hmm. um, he came to Halifax, surprisingly. And he gets, like, he hobbles up on stage. The mm -hmm. moment his fingers wrap around a mic, he comes alive like it has electrocuted him. And he it's is the amazing. same Aussie he's always been. But the best part is he was touring with Sharon, and she stopped the show to make him eat a sandwich on stage to keep his energy up and then let him continue. That is outstanding. <laughs> that was cute. <laughs> you know, the crazy part of Ozzy, the mm -hmm. entire family having grew up and watched their show mm -hmm. and looking at them now, I go, wow. And you know, Jack toss talks about the whole sobriety thing. Right. Kelly talks about it. Ozzy and Sharon talk about it. Mm -hmm. And they're themselves. That's what makes yeah. the episode so cool. It's always cool. A lot of celebrities, I think, are creating podcasts now, but mm -hmm. there's not a lot that I would listen to. Theirs, I listen to religiously just because it's interesting. Well, and and uh, Ozzy and Jack had that uh, paranormal show for a while. Yeah, I got to listen to that. That's good. That's got to be good. It is. Jack actually works with a few. The one of the mediums uh, that. Uh, was just with him. They've worked together also. She was uh, one of the people from Paranormal State. Do you remember that show? Oh, okay. I do remember that show. That was like yeah. one of the more interesting ones. I was going to say one of the better ones, but I'm going to say one of the more interesting ones. <laughs> well, she actually gave me a few concepts I looked at and I go, hmm, that's not a bad idea. It's not a bad concept. Uh, one of them would explain Dorothy Edie somewhat. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Supposedly what she says is that we're all one energy. Mm -hmm. So everything in the world, like you can't give and take away. So no matter who you are, but as you're doing that up and down through potentially like different dimensions and stuff, mm -hmm. sometimes energies will run into other energies and they almost transfer information when they do that. Like a mashup kind of thing. Yeah, kind of. Oh, that's interesting. I never would have thought of that on my own, I don't think. The other thing that she talked about was she went to another country. Everyone's mm -hmm. going to be like, we're on the freaking Bell Witch, and now we're over on the Osmond. I'm <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, this Give me is one second. I get this out of my head. We'll keep it. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. But uh, she talked about how 
like she went to another country or something. And one of the, I forget what it was, one of the entities she didn't know, like is not here in the States. She could never see it. She could never see it. Hmm. And all the other mediums are theirs. Like it's literally right there. Like, how can you not, not see it? And she said when she was there for a little bit of time, because mm-hmm. she started acknowledging things, she was then able to see it. So she thinks you're not able to sense things until you have enough knowledge and then it brings itself forward. Possible. That's possible. Which is kind of interesting. Again, it's just concepts. This is where I come up with half yeah. my crazy ideas. But you guys should be thankful because those crazy ideas sometimes yeah. get us to the end. Yeah, that's why we've <laughs> solved every episode we've ever done. Exactly. That's why. But Solve speaking well. of the old Bell Witch, do you, for anyone that doesn't know, who wants to hear what happens in the beginning? Well, it doesn't really tell you what happens. The next segment kind of yeah. breaks down the family and stuff like that. Who wants to hear that? Oh, I want to hear that. Me. I do. I do. Perfect. And everyone else. <laughs> You're going to do it anyway. <laughs> Here we go. Our tale takes place in the early 19th century. The Bell family, led by John Bell, a farmer of strong character and ambition, left their life in North Carolina behind, drawn by the promise of fertile land and a new start. With them came his wife, Lucy Bell, a woman of grace and resilience, and their children, each with dreams and laughter echoing in their steps. The Bell family settled into a life of rural tranquility. Their farm, a sprawling expanse of land, was a testament to their hard work and determination. Fields of crops swayed under the Tennessee sun, and the air was filled with the sounds of a bustling, happy homestead. John and Lucy, along with their children, Jesse, John Jr., Drury, Betsy, Richard, and Joel, worked hand in hand to build a life on this new frontier. Days were spent tending to the fields and livestock, while evenings brought the family together, sharing stories by the fireplace, the children's laughter mingling with the crackling of the flames. Neighbors were few but friendly, forming a close-knit community that supported each other through the trials and triumphs of frontier life. Little did the Bells know their peaceful existence was soon to be shattered, giving way to a story that would transcend time, a tale of mystery, fear, and the unexplained. Sounds like good folks so far. Good maybe, folks, listen. Maybe I'll be okay. Maybe I will be happy and not scared. I mean, maybe. Listen. Maybe. Sometimes we got to build the narration. I want people to understand who <laughs> these people are. So move from North Carolina to Tennessee. Right. I have no clue why they moved. I can't find a record anywhere explaining why they moved. Like, most people I can go back in the in the books mm. and go like, okay, this is why they moved. That being said, I did find that there was multiple reasons why they would have potentially moved. Okay. What were some of those some of reasons? Those, so sometimes it was just seeking new land. So they came from North Carolina and they moved obviously to Tennessee. Mm-hmm. The thought process was, the land was a little bit more fertile. And as it, sa- as it states, these are farmers. Right. So John, it was a farming family. So in North Carolina, though the land is hospitable for crops, Tennessee's better. Okay. How, how far apart are these? I'm sorry. I don't know the geography well. Mm, I mean, significant enough for back then. I mean, we're talking 1800s. So, I mean pretty significant i mean we're talking multiple days to get there okay uh there was also economic reasons a lot of times they believe that during this time frame it was not uncommon Uh, another thing is sometimes parts of families would move and a lot of times they would move with their family right so even though they wasn't in the same area and later on in the story i think i put in the narration if not there is the acknowledgement of family being there. Now, we don't know that they live there, but I highly doubt they're going to move from another, let's say in this case, North Carolina, go all the way to Tennessee just to see whatever this is. Right, right. So if I was to speculate, that would be my speculation. And the other big thing that they talked about was just the adventure of going out and trying new things. So we don't truly know, but that's the biggest reasons that someone would is how I'll put it. Okay. Yeah, just, just uh, shooting off from home, maybe. Just try could be. something new. 
very well could be. And for anyone that doesn't know this, watching on the YouTube machine, you're like, what's he looking at? I've got a whole page worth of notes. We have 10 segments in this story. Okay. Um, and I, there's a lot of things that I did not put in narration. I'm going to try to keep everything kind in this one spot. So a bigger family, not too small. And we're going to hear specifically three of these names a lot in tonight's story. So just to, to be sure we've got John, we've got Lucy, Lucy's the wife, right? Then we've got Jesse, John Jr. Drury which is a different name. D R. Yeah. That's the one I was W-R-Y. wondering about. Yeah. Drury. Drury. That's actually, yeah. Drury. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Betsy, Richard and Joel. Okay. I, I'll be Two, darned four, if I'm going to be able six. to keep track of all of that. That's a lot of <laughs> you. The, literally you're going to, of the kids, you only need to remember one. Is it Drury? It is not. Oh, okay. Oh, that's good. So you're, Woo. You're kind of safe. <laughs> is it John Jr.? Is it John it Jr.? It is not John Jr. Okay. I'm going to wait and find out, I guess. <laughs> you I, th- I think they were to go. I know. I think they were moving to get more child tax somewhere or <laughs> child benefits or whatever. <laughs> Very well could be. So a larger family. I mean, think about it. They moved. They made this heavy move again. Why did they move? We don't know. But that is one heck of a move back then. Mm. Uh, obviously this is all rural life there in a farm. They talked about there being a community there. Community was not real big. They mm. said that you'd have to make a little bit of distance to, to visit, but they said everyone was pretty cool with each other. There was no one that yeah. had really significant differences. This is the Hopkinsville goblins all over again. Yes. The same scenario anyway, uh, rural farmhouse neighbors that are kind of distant, you know, so they're a little bit isolated. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So, um, above and beyond that, I think we covered most of the other stuff. Um, and the big thing to remember too, is this is the 1800s, the kids, mm. they probably did almost as much work as what adults do now. <laughs> right, know? right. So they might do more. It's a hard life in those 1800s. It is. It, it was extreme. I mean, think about Little House on the Prairie, man. They was yeah. working at like eight. That's why you which had is all crazy. those kids. <laughs> Your own <laughs> to, workforce. To, correct. Now, another thing to mention is uh, they were doing farming. Right. And by farming, they also had animals. That's going to play into it. There's going to be at right. least a couple animal segments. Like so there's a decent that gives away story going. names <laughs> <laughs> like the dog on bell witch and no one get it confused. It's not the Blair, Witch. that's a different right, story, right, right? Different story. Um, so it kind of gives the capability of understanding that this is a pretty tranquil environment at this point. They've lived there. They've not had a whole lot of issues and then things start happening. Oh, I've been lulled into a false sense of security. I see. Yes. <laughs> now, what I want to do is when we play this next segment, Nick, I want you to think about the activities and where we've heard these activities before. <laughs> okay. Do you want to play the next segment so you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, while it's fresh in my mind what my homework <laughs> is, let's play this next step. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> The year was 1817. The Bell family had settled into their new life, the rhythm of the farm as familiar as the rising and setting of the sun. But as autumn whispered into the hills of Tennessee, a chill ran through the air, a prelude to events as mysterious as the night is dark. It started subtly, almost innocuously. It was a sound, a faint knocking, like the gentle rap of a visitor at the door. But these knocks came in the dead of night, when the world was asleep and no earthly visitor would be afoot. John Bell, ever the protector of his family, searched, but found no source, no reason for these nocturnal disturbances. Then there were the bedsheets. The children spoke of waking in the night, a cold breeze on their faces, only to find their bedsheets removed, lying in heaps on the floor. A prank, they first thought, but no guilty sibling came forward, and the incidents repeated, each time more unsettling than the last. 
The farm, once a haven of peace, began to feel different. The animals, loyal companions and essential to their livelihood, started to behave oddly. The Bell's dogs, usually calm and friendly, growled at unseen entities, their eyes following movements that no human eye could see. Chickens and livestock became restless, as if disturbed by an invisible presence. Then came the sighting of strange creatures. John Bell himself spoke of seeing an animal, the likes of which he'd never seen before. A dog with the head of a rabbit, an apparition that vanished as quickly as it appeared. His children told tales of birds of extraordinary size, shadows that moved with a life of their own. This was just the beginning. What started as knocks and misplaced bed sheets would soon escalate into events that defied all rational explanation. The family, once wrapped in the security of their home and land, now faced a reality where the lines between the natural and the supernatural began to blur. So this one, Nick, Mm -hmm. what did you notice that we've seen in the past? I've got three distinct thoughts on this. One is the one you're talking about, I'm pretty sure. And that's the Mm -hmm. infield poltergeist where Mm -hmm. the children were in the same room and their beds were shaken and all that stuff. That's number one. Number two, this is an awful lot like David Eggers' The Witch. Have you ever seen that? Mm Mm-mm. No. Uh, good movie from the same person who did the lighthouse and that kind of thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and the third thing is I've seen that dog thing before or something like it. It's not uncommon, but typically where do we acknowledge seeing or hearing things like this? There's one uh, location where it happens a lot. One location where it happens a lot. As soon as I say it, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, what uh, has, what is known for shape shifting? Uh, demons or tricks or spirits. One location I was thinking of Skinwalker Ranch. Ah, oh, darn. Yes, you're right. I should have. Because a of lot that. of those, yeah, a lot of those, they, they shape shift. They talk about uh, deers, especially, will shape shift mm. there. Yeah, and I think we talked before about, like, the Native American legends of, like, the deer lady and stuff. I yes. Think, I think she goes and punishes people. <laughs> yes, Nick would know about that. <laughs> Facts! But I find it interesting. Again, we've said this. I can't remember where we said this at. It's like mm. they take the same playbook and they yeah. just go, yep, check, yep, check, yep, check. Like, it's... It's crazy when we look at all these different cases and mm. on my channel, it's all paranormal. Every, every yeah. story is paranormal. I literally, every episode go check, check, check. Like, it's crazy. It, it's the consistency that makes you wonder like, oh, there's gotta be something to this. Like clearly Skinwalker Ranch people and the Bell Witch people probably never heard of one another. Like, you know, right. And all these other ones. So it's the consistency that gets me. Like you said, there's a checklist that these things do. Yes. And I think the thing that frustrates me is a lot of time in science, mm-hmm. they're quick to disprove everything. But again, when, when you're a scientist, what do you do? You look for the same thing that occurs over and over and over again. And then you try to replicate it. You try to figure out how right. to replicate it. I think that's where it falls apart, though. It, true. Because you can't you true. can't replicate that in a lab. Like you can't make a skinwalker come to your lab, or you can't correct make a ghost but my come point, to your lab. Correct. But my point is, mm-hmm. we we're replicating it at different locations by different people. So it right. means that there's something there. But the question is why? That's the question. Right. Yeah, and that that's the one that they're not they're having trouble answering. Cuz you can't just right. always say, "Oh, it's psychology, psychology all the time." Like it's if we had people imagining the exact same thing across millions of people, it would be an event. Right? Well, and that's the thing. Like uh so I'm a member of our ghost that's a subreddit community for anyone that doesn't mm-hmm. know. There is a ton of skeptics there. Ton of skeptics. Right. Like it's 
the amount of people that's there that are skeptics is crazy. Mm. But I actually appreciate that to a degree. And the reason I appreciate it is because I wrote something. So I'm looking it up. Um, there was one day where I posted, and I can't remember why I posted what I did uh, or what whatever day it was, but mm. there was a skeptic in there. And, you know, it, it, they're a lot like scientists to a, deg- to a degree. They're so fast to disprove something without providing any kind of um, – What's like alternate theory for? or something. Yeah, kind of, yeah. But it's amazing okay. to me because I actually know which one it was. It was actually, I did a, uh, I did one on Lizzie Borden. Because hmm. she haunts two locations, but I only put one of the, one of the locations in. But it always cracks me up when I look at the comments from skeptics and like this is what they typically will say uh which drives me crazy there were so many comments on this one i'm sorry it takes me a second to find it here it is they said go ahead and give me proof that the entity entity exists i'll be waiting hmm. and i get it if you're a skeptic you're like prove it to me right right but again there are certain limitations of what any of us can do. So my exact response back is, well, I appreciate the request for concrete evidence. The realm of paranormal only rests in personal encounters and subjective experiences. Scientifically, the existence of ghosts remains unproven, but it's equally challenging to disprove them given the anecdotal nature of most claims. Hmm. Which that's again, as a, as a skeptic, you know, I would think they'd be like, okay, well, what, what can you prove? Like if I was playing the opposite role, right. First off, this person came and they're like, prove it to me. I'll be waiting. Like that's already, yeah. you're being defensive. You're being defensive. Yeah, why you're why not are they there. even in this group? Correct. Well, th- there's a bunch of the skeptics in there. It used yeah. to be really bad. There's actually a couple mods now that are really cool. This kind of, they're making them, everyone kind of play by the same rules is the best way I'll put yeah. it. Well, I mean, I, I'm a skeptic, but mm-hmm. I enjoy this stuff as well. This guy sounds like he's like, I don't believe any of this and you have to prove it to me. Well, why are you here? Correct, correct, correct. That's Yeah, exactly. And the very next thing he said goes exactly along the lines. And then I want to read exactly what I wrote because it corresponds with what we're talking about here. Okay. He said, they don't need to be disproven. This isn't how it works. The burden of proof is on the people making extraordinary claims about something which still has zero actual evidence for its existence. And anecdotal evidence is not actually evidence at all, let alone convincing enough to necessarily uh, to necessitate anyone. This guy can't write disproving it to claim that it is somehow challenging to disprove something that only the anecdotal evidence is in the favor is just silly. But I would also argue that the very fact that there is zero evidence in spite of countless people over hundreds and hundreds of years actively trying to obtain evidence and prove their existence does pretty much a good job of disproving it. So his standpoint is there's zero evidence. And this is probably the best mic drop answer I've ever gave in my entire life because this guy. (laughs) All right. I'm ready for it. Because I'm like, you know, this, this is my life. Like, this is literally what I talk about. The thing with me is it's not, I don't have an interest because I find this stuff interesting. I've had experiences myself that Mm. I can't answer. So I'm trying to understand for me, what is my experience? Why do I feel the things I feel? Why do I see or why have I seen the things that I have seen? I want to prove it more than anyone. But my exact words, throughout history, there's been many cases where phenomena existed with zero scientific explanation. You would be the same person that said quantum mechanics doesn't exist. Show me proof of it. I'll wait. 
all the same concepts that defy scientific census of the times. It's only through advancements in technology and theory that evidences of these phenomena beyond are beyond undeniable. Current scientific methods may or may not be able to prove or disprove the existence of paranormal entities. It doesn't categorically rule out their existence. It simply means we haven't yet developed the tools or the understanding necessary to measure the observable to make it scientific verified way, regardless of taking the approach. Show me the proof and I'll wait. Would have, would have kept civilizations in the Stone Age to this day. The whole point of having a separate like this, a uh, separate conversation like this, is to talk about these kind of events. These simple comments that are left doesn't add anything to the narrative other than I'm a genius and I know everything, you're wrong, blah, 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 blah. Thank God for science community that, that does not take this approach in advancing us forward. So my point is... Mm, very good. My point is, you want to say, give me the proof. You can't disprove it. I'll wait, whatever it may be. My thing is, we said the same thing. Uh, um, shoot, what's uh, the stuff that they used to put on the watch hands to make them glow? Uh, oh, uh, shoot. Uranium um, or? Uh, it's not uranium, but. It, uh, uh, it is an fudge. active isotope, though, I think. And it's radioactive, right? Yeah, exactly. We had no way of knowing. Back then, we had no clue, no clue about radiation poisoning. That was, it would be the same equivalent, the same exact equivalent of what this guy is saying. Mm -hmm. It's not killing people. Prove it. I'll sit here and I'll wait. Well, yeah. guess what, genius? Over time, we go, there's something to this. So what did we do? We created ways of being able to measure mm -hmm. radiation. And then we go, oh, wait, that's killing people. Right. We just, I believe at this stage in our life, we don't, we're trying, like we're trying all kinds of things, elect electrical magnetic fields. Mm -hmm. We're looking at the temperature indiscretions in different areas. We're looking at radio waves. We're looking at um, visual differences. We're looking at mm -hmm. countless different electric voice phenomena, EVPs. Again, is that going to rule one day that there is paranormal activity? I don't believe so. But I think we're on the cuff of having a concept or an idea that will develop into something. Well, yeah. And this, this kind of touches on my feelings about stuff. I believe that this stuff happens like i believe mm -hmm. there's some kind of ghostly thing i believe there's some kind of monster thing aliens all this stuff but what i don't believe is any of it's outside the realm of reality i think there is a scientific explanation to everything for sure but if i was the, if someone told me in ancient history that the earth was round when everyone thought it was flat and I said, prove it, I'll wait. My right. dust would have blown around the world three times before someone was able to prove it. Correct. Technological advancement follows theory. Correct. Like, we have theories about these things, and when the technology catches up that we can learn more about it, we do, not before then. And let's be honest, the vast majority of the time when we do it, it's not because mm -hmm. we go, hey, I'm going to study whatever this is, right? It's, there's a benefit. There's a right. benefit in whatever it may be. In this mm. case, it's paranormal. There's no scientist that goes, boy, I want to learn if there's life after de death. Boy, I want to learn if we there's other dimensions or other realms. There's mm. scientific hypothesis out there, hypothesis is out there, but it's not like there's money in that. So they're not yeah. going to waste their time and energy on that kind of thing. It's going to have to take someone in the paranormal world to piece some of this together that maybe has a little bit of, I watched a show this weekend. I can't remember what the name of the show was. And I apologize if it's your show, I'm sorry, but it's a believer that brought five scientists, five scientists to a paranormal hotspot. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm going to give you all these tools. We're going to walk around and I want you as a scientist 
to figure out what's going on. You know what all scientists did? Go ahead. Is very interesting. They cared more about taking everything apart to figure out if there was a scientific reason for things going off. Mm. Which is smart, right? I don't think in doing that. I go, yes, paranormal equipment will work. They were taking apart going, is there a reason? Right that this would cause this. And when they figured out in most of the occasions, there was not. When there was activity, they're like, I can't explain that. That was wild. Right. Right. And there's their nothing scientific wrong brain with saying on. that. No, there's, absolutely there's not. There's nothing wrong with saying you don't know. Right. And it's like the, every single day I post in that forum for the most part, one story about a known and documented entity mm-hmm. from around the world. This isn't just, hey, I heard there was this ghost over in Bill's house. These are like, like the one I was just talking about was a Lizzie Borden ghost. (laughs) Right. Like this is a known, pretty famous one. Yeah. Which also, by the way, for anyone that doesn't know, uh, the podcast that I did this week, which would have been three, four weeks ago, however long ago, was on the Lizzie Borden house. That's why I did Mm -hmm. research on that one. But that ghost haunts two locations, which is crazy. Oh, busy. Yeah, but it goes back to this Bell Witch episode, and the reason I say that is, again, we don't understand whatever this is, but we see the same patterns. We see the same Mm. formats every single time. There's something to it. You can't have this same checklist of things happening time after time after time after time and go, it's all anecdotal. Like, there's, prove it to me, I'll wait. It's just yeah, crazy the, to me. That that proof might be forthcoming in a hundred years from now. We don't know. Could be a thousand yeah. years from now. Yeah, we just, could be a thousand. There's no way of knowing. And and it's it just could impossible. Be, it could be that this is nothing. But if it were anything else and we had these things happening over and over again, we'd look into it. So why not this? But it would go back to like a prime example go 100 years ago no one knew what quantum mechanics was nobody right right that was all science fiction mm-hmm. like you said the world uh, was not round for a period of time either right you know it all comes down to having the capabilities to understand this stuff but the the one thing that ticks me off the most is when skeptics automatically disprove and they go I'll sit here and wait okay You want me to prove it to you? Great. Make it easy for me. Disprove it. And for anyone that says there's zero evidence of paranormal, in a court of law, there's a good chance if you do something wrong, you're going to go to jail because somebody saw you do it. Mm. They don't have proof you did it, but they're pretty sure that they saw you do it. When there is thousands tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of ghost hauntings, and they all fit a very similar list. And these are old stories. Mm. These are, these are 1800s. They didn't have books where they would read it and go, man, that sounds like a good ghost story. I think ours is going to do the same thing. Like it's different day and age. That's my whole point. But one of the things that was interesting is the shape shifting animal which mm. goes back to Skinwalker. Now, we did not see that in Enfield. That's something no, new. But, but you do see that with witch familiars, though, also. You do. Mm. You absolutely do. Interesting. It's very interesting. That's why I say there's a lot of different... The other thing that I mentioned, I don't know if you caught it or not, they saw shadow people. I did not catch that. That's important. <laughs> yes. So they saw shadow shadows that was lingering around. They heard the knocks, mm-hmm. which most almost every single story we talk about, it starts with some form of a knock, a bang, a yeah. scratch, something every single time. Uh, the animal, the animals were acknowledging it mm-hmm. and the specialized animal that uh, John saw. Yeah. Those things are now creepy. Are you re- they're always creepy, Nick. <laughs> are you ready to advance to the next section? Yeah. Let's, which is going to break it down part. a little bit more. As the weeks turned to months, the strange occurrences on the Bell Farm did not just persist, they intensified. 
What began as mere knocks and unexplained noises evolved into something far more alarming, something that would challenge the very fabric of the Bell family's reality. The disturbances grew bolder, more frequent. Night after night, the family was awakened by sounds of chains being dragged across floors, clattering and echoing through the once peaceful home. The knocks grew into thunderous bangs, as if invisible hands were pounding on the walls with furious intent. But it was not just sounds that haunted the bells. The unseen force now began to manifest in a far more disturbing manner. Betsy, the youngest daughter, found herself the focus of this malevolent presence. Night after night, she experienced chilling physical interactions. Her hair was pulled, not playfully but viciously, as if unseen hands were grasping at her with malicious intent. She would wake up with bruises and marks on her body, the pain a stark reminder of her unseen tormentor. John Bell, the head of the household, was not spared either. He began to experience episodes of paralysis, an invisible grip that seemed to hold him in place, rendering him helpless. His health started to deteriorate, with mysterious ailments that left even the local doctors baffled. The physical interactions were accompanied by sounds of a more disturbing nature. Whispering voices that seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere at once filled the house. At first, these whispers were indistinct, mere murmurs in the dark. But slowly, they grew clearer as if the entity was finding its voice, learning how to breach the barrier between its world and ours. Fear took root in the Bell home. The nights, once a time for rest and dreams, became a stage for unseen horrors. Each member of the family lay awake, wondering what the darkness would bring, what new terror would emerge from the shadows. But this was still only the beginning. The entity, whatever it was, was growing stronger, bolder, and its intentions were becoming increasingly sinister. The Bells, once a family living a dream of frontier prosperity, now found themselves in the midst of a living nightmare. Danny, you made me jump. <laughs> that last knock there scared the heck out of me. <laughs> That's the whole point, Nick. That's oh, the whole you point. win. You won. <laughs> <laughs> no, this so, so yeah, so the the entity's getting stronger. We've seen this on a lot of episodes. Yes. And it, it really does creep me out thinking of it the way that it was put here, where it's discovering how to interact further with our world it's almost like it's reminds me of in the watchman when that guy started learning to free form himself and there'd be like a screaming skeleton in the hallway and it would disappear and that kind of thing that freaks me out well see that's the thing like when we look at there was a couple takeaways that i got from this Hmm. all the way around and the first one was it's advancing, like you said, but it's also picking targets in the household. Right. We've got Betsy. That's the one that I should have guessed earlier. Yes. Betsy was the one. Betsy became one of the central points mm-hmm. of the entire household. In fact, we're going to be rolling with Betsy a decent amount this evening, in addition to obviously John. Was Betsy the youngest? <sighs> I want to say she was either on the younger side or on the older side. Let me see if I've got that in my notes somewhere. I don't think I've got their okay. ages. I don't think. Um, but we can do a quick search. I, I feel um, like it said that she was the youngest, but I'm not sure. I might have imagined that. And if I imagined it, the reason is because that's how a lot of these things are. They manifest with the youngest child as they come up through. She was a middle child, come to find out. Oh, so okay. Betsy, yep, also known as Elizabeth pattern. Bell. Yeah, her name was Elizabeth Bell, went by Betsy, and she was one of the middle children. Okay, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. So didn't choose the youngest, didn't choose the oldest. Uh, now, I did look, um, and I'm trying to remember. Mm-hmm. I want to say, because my one of the things that I was curious about was... Okay, so from oldest to youngest was Jesse, John, Drury, Betsy, Richard, and Joel. Okay. Does it say right there their ages when it started or no? Uh, 
this all started. We're about to find out, though. Oh, okay. I think she was either right before the age or during the age of poltergeists and children. Yeah, you knew where I was getting to. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, missed the first pattern, but got the next one. <laughs> so here's what's crazy. Jesse, at the time of this, would have been 27 years old. Oh, older. John, kids. 24. Drury, 23. Betsy, 11. Mm-hmm. So we're at that mm-hmm. teenage years. Yeah. Richard was six and Joel was at four. Wow, there's a real diversity of children's ages going on here. Yeah, That's between Drury and Betsy, right there is a, a 12 years in difference from the third oldest to Betsy was 12 years. Man, that, doesn't that seem and then 11, wild? 6, 4. Like- that yeah, that's definitely interesting. It seems a little weird, yeah. Yeah, I bet we can't find out why, but I bet there's some kind of story to that. I know I looked it up because um, I knew there was a huge difference between the oldest and Betsy when I did the research. And I was like, why is it so old? But I thought she was the yeah. youngest. So I just thought, well, maybe they had, you know, these kids and it balanced out. But yeah. um, I don't remember it bridging into that. I don't, no, I, I've heard I don't a lot of stories that. and none of them ever explain that either. But I, I feel like back in those days, there would have been a story to that. In which, you know, it could explain why they moved too, mm. right? Yeah. Like there could have been a reason. Think. Yeah. Now, another thing is, and we it started talking about with her, it, it started pulling her by the hair. Mm. Like this was aggressive right off the get go with Betsy. Yeah. And if you remember infield, it was just throwing them. Right. So, some of them try to ingratiate themselves. Like, um, I always forget his last, his first name, but Doe. Roland. His? Roland Doe. I think that one started mm-hmm. out trying to get in his good graces. Uh, right. Through his aunt, wasn't it? Uh, so his aunt, yeah, she was the one that was into the uh, the supernatural, kind of the occult. Yeah, but the but the Enfield and this one starting off abusive right from the get go. Yes. And the other thing that I noticed in this one is, it's kind of in terror da- or in uh, it's uh, in in uh, I was gonna say interrogate. That's not the right word. There is starting to uh, not intimidate. It's trying to. Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? It sounds the same. Subject. Um, no, it doesn't matter. It's trying to provoke them, basically. Right, right. Um, and at this point, it's it's whispers. It's just mm. simply whispers, and it's kind of communicating. What the, the equivalent, it, it almost feels like these supernatural entities, whatever they are, when it's a case like this, it's almost like a kid. They start to crawl, yeah. then they figure out how to walk, they figure out, knocks and bangs and that's how they communicate and yeah. then they start into whispers we're at the whisper stage right now but mm-hmm. i don't know if you caught this or not john is starting to experience some health issues mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. these things are and being that's born the into first. this world yes so it's interesting that all of a sudden they go from being fine Now, John's symptoms is he's having uh, paralysis. Uh, That's a big one. Yes. He's having seizures and convulsions, facial contortions and pain. He's starting to get cases of delirium Mm. and general weakness and the decline of health. He sounds like he's the one that's possessed. It's kind of interesting. There's that many different issues. Now, I started looking because I'm like, man, that was a different day and age. Like, what could, like, nowadays, if we tried to say, hey, what could this possibly be? Right. That's where my mm-hmm. mind went. And you're going to smile when I name one of these off. Right. But back then, different day and age, mm-hmm. if you went to the doctor, this is what the doctor would have said. Firstly, it would have just been a straight up medical condition that they wouldn't have been able to solve. Possibly, mm-hmm. 
like a stroke or a neurological disorder, mm-hmm. which wouldn't have been understood a hundred percent, but they understood there was something. This goes yeah. back to the conversation we talked about earlier. Well, he just fell over dead. Don't know what's wrong. I'll wait yeah. until you find the answer. Yeah, that's God. right. <laughs> Idiot. It's going to get awful stinky before you do. but <laughs> Exactly. But this is a case. They yeah. didn't know what a stroke was back then, but they knew that it occurred. They didn't know what caused it. Yeah. So they would have called it whatever they called it before a stroke. Second one would have been psychological stress. Mm-hmm. Psychological stress can cause a lot of these things when there's anxiety added to the table. Mm-hmm. It will manifest in some of the conditions, the paralysis. The weakness, uh, the pain that he's feeling, all those things can be caused up in our brain. Oh, for sure. For sure. The third one, poisoning. Hmm. Interesting. Which, uh, yeah, it's very interesting they talk about poisoning. These are all reactions to long-term poisoning. Yes, very much so. And they said that it it typically corresponds with all of those things. And the last one was mass hysteria. Mass hysteria. Which seems to be like their favorite answer. I don't think there's enough people here to be mass hysteria. <laughs> but okay, Not well, yet. we'll enter it into the maybe pile, I guess. <laughs> now, if we look at it from supernatural theories, right. we've got a few. Mm -hmm. malevolent spirit or witches that's not uncommon for that to happen it says the most prominent theory as per legend itself is a malevolent spirit or a witch was responsible for the disturbances with john bell's ailments Mm. second one this is apparently relatively common also in the world of poltergeist activity which i didn't know that i also do not know that and don't necessarily accept it either. Yeah, that's what it said. It said some paranormal researchers have suggested that the events bear the hallmark of typical poltergeist activity in heavy levels, characterized by physical disturbances, unexplained phenomena often centered on a particular individual. I I, I mean, I think they're making sweeping characterizations and, I I don't think that's accurate of what we just heard. I don't think so either, but that's from paranormal investigators or researchers. Uh, The third Uh, one is a curse. Agree to disagree with them, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Third one is a curse. Okay. And the last one kind of fits a little bit with the first one, which is witchcraft or occult practices. Well, we know curses are real after last week. Yes. Um, So I'm going to, I'm going to, put a pin in that one but uh yes witchcraft and that kind of stuff that's interesting it, it's no different than robert the doll right uh um, yeah i think we've talked about robert the doll here quite a few oh, yeah. times yep we have that that was supposedly a cursed doll mm. and that was occult stuff so you know whether you believe in it or you don't believe into it yeah. again i see enough circumstances where that's a thing i mean you look at louisiana and the level of voodoo there, oh, explain yeah. that all the way for me. I'll, I'll tell you, even the staunchest skeptics, I think everyone has some degree of belief in things that are lucky and things that are unlucky. Well, like, for sure. I think everyone's got a little bit of belief in that kind of thing. I think you, to a degree, you have to, I think. Yeah. I think if you don't, then you're missing big picture is what I believe. Right. Oh, I don't know. Curses are something I don't think of a lot. I joke about them a lot at work. Every time something happens, I'm like, you know what caused that? Witches. (laughs) I would like all the witches out there that's listening to this and know that I've never once accused you of anything. I you put whatever daily. voodoo you put on Nick, not on me. Don't on do the it daily. Me. Woo! On the daily. But I, I've got Man, some weird strong. habits. Like, and, and people tell me all the time it's like OCD, but I think it's really knowing how the world works. Like, I have to enter through one certain door at work because it's lucky and makes the day better. If I enter through the makes other sense. door, 
it's unlucky and makes Screws it, it all worse. Up. Yeah. So I'm really a believer in silly superstitions and luck. Like when I go buy our recycle bins, I got to tap, tap, tap the top. Otherwise it's bad <laughs> luck. Listen, you won't hear a complaint out of me, Nick. You will not yeah. hear a complaint out of me. Well, see, this is the thing. Everyone teases me about it, but I said, okay, tomorrow I'll come in the wrong door, not tap the things, and we'll see what kind of emergency has arise. And they're like, no, no, you don't have to do that. <laughs> and anything is possible. Listen, just let right. him, let Nick have his way and see if it, maybe it happens. We don't know. Yeah. They, they don't want to take the chance that I am right. So they must believe it a little bit. Now, the next segment, Nick, is what reminded me a little bit of our story last week. Oh, okay. But yeah, Jeff, kind of waiting for the this. talking mongoose. Yes. Yeah. This is what really kind of got me going to a degree because I'm like, I wonder if there's a correlation here. Okay. Yeah. Can I hear this? I'm, I'm interested. Here we go. In the depths of the haunting that gripped the Bell family, a new, more chilling element emerged, a voice. It began subtly, a whisper barely distinguishable from the wind rustling through the trees outside. But as days passed, this whisper grew into a voice, clear and unmistakable. This voice, it seemed, belonged to no one and yet, it was as real as the fear it instilled. It spoke with intelligence, purpose, and, at times, a terrifying intensity. The family would often find themselves conversing with this disembodied voice, a bizarre and surreal experience that defied all logic and understanding. The voice was not limited to speech alone. It demonstrated an uncanny ability to mimic the voices of others, friends, distant relatives, even people the family had not seen in years. It was as if the entity behind the voice had access to their memories, their past, pulling voices from the depths of their minds to further instill a sense of unease and terror. In its conversations with the family, the voice made a chilling claim. It was the spirit of old Kate, known in the local folklore as the Bell Witch. This spectral entity, according to the voice, had chosen the Bell family for a reason, a purpose that it delighted in keeping shrouded in mystery. The reasons for the haunting, as voiced by the entity, were as varied as they were confusing. It spoke of a wrong done to it, of seeking vengeance, of a mission to torment specifically John Bell and his youngest daughter, Betsy. The specifics were often contradictory, but the intent was clear. The entity had a vendetta, and the Bells were its chosen target. The voice of the Bell Witch became a constant presence in their lives, an invisible yet ever-present force that conversed, taunted, and tormented. It was an auditory manifestation of the haunting that left the family in a perpetual state of dread. No longer were they just dealing with mysterious noises and physical assaults. They were now in the grip of an entity that could speak, reason, and seemingly understand their deepest fears. So now we're adding a little bit more to the story, Nick. Mm -hmm. Much like Jeff the Mongoose, now this thing's talking and it's not shutting up. Yeah, yeah, it's it's gotten... It's, it's at its toddler stage where it wants to tell you about everything. Exactly. And much like a toddler, it's lying. Mm. I have developed a theory mm -hmm. that explains some of our questions from earlier, like the giant gap between children. Mm -hmm. So we know a couple things. There's a, big unusual gap between the ages of the children 12 years yeah 12 years that's unusual for that time that would be unusual for this time mm -hmm. they moved quite some ways away unusual again there's some theories mm -hmm. like you put forward of why they moved and now the witch or the entity claims it has a vendetta against the husband and the first daughter that would have been born after the long period of not having children. So here is my, is my story. This is the story I've come up with during this last segment. I'm ready. I want to, I want to hear this, Nick. Come on now. So John Bell and his wife got married quite young. Mm -hmm. And right off the bat, 
one after the other started having children, which was common for the times. And this was in their own hometown. All of a sudden, John starts to lose interest in his wife. They're not sleeping together very much. On the side, he's seeing a girl secretly. Because this is not something that can happen in these times. And this is a girl named Kate, who may or may not have been a witch. He sees her for quite a number of years. And... You know, they keep it on the down low. He's not really sleeping with his wife very much. But on occasion he does because he's got to keep up the charade and that kind of thing. After quite some time, his wife is pregnant again. 12 years oh, difference. Man. Kate's not going to like that. All of a sudden he's, yeah, Kate's not like that. He tells her, look, my wife's going to have another kid. I got to <sighs> stop doing this. We can never be together. Mm-hmm. Kate, the possible witch, angry at John Bell, holds the kid responsible, even though that's completely unreasonable. She keeps threatening and threatening to out him, like anything she can do to get him back, threatening his way of life whatsoever. Maybe Kate goes missing. No one's able to find her. They don't Uh know what happened to her. Maybe John Bell does. But I bet John does. He doesn't want the harassment. He he knows what's happened. He's like, well, you know, we're going to strike out somewhere else. We're going to move away, take our children with us. And after this time, he's learned his lesson. He sticks with the wife and they start producing children again, just like they did. They're popping them off. Before the witch Kate come into the picture. Now, That's right. Kate is at the bottom of a swamp or bog somewhere. She's oh. dead, but she was a witch. So she's working on coming back into their lives. And she wants John to suffer and the child that she blames for their breakup to suffer. That's, that is solid. That that's quite the story that just popped into my head. That makes me think it's real because it was so easy. It could listen, it could be real. Maybe she's talking through you right now, Nick. Maybe she is. She wants people to know that she is not happy. I wouldn't be happy with John to this day. Scallywag. No, I could totally see that happening though. Like I just made that out of whole cloth right here. <laughs> I could totally see that happen. It's very possible. Yeah, there's I mean, a lot of think about it. Like well, and this this has had numerous movies, plays, yeah, uh, songs wrote about it. There's all kinds of stuff with the Bell Witch. Yeah, this this but, is what I've come up with. Well, and here's the interesting thing: when we look at it's advanced, we talked about that, obviously, right? Just like I said, it, the family would often find themselves conversing with the disembodied voices. Like Jeff the Talking Mongoose. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They should never correspond with it, but they did. No. Well, you can't be rude. I mean, you could be. <laughs> you could be. Right. They just got to They got to find their inner Scrooge. That's what they got to That's right. Do. That's right. Inner Scrooge. Bring him out. <laughs> but the fascinating thing is, mm-hmm. this is the only thing to screw up your story a little bit, Nick. Uh-oh. It had the uncanny ability to mimic everything from their friends, distant relatives, even people in the family that they had not seen for years. All right. But Kate might and have it was met able all to, those people. She's well, from the same so hometown. The way that this was wrote is probably right. not a great way. She also mimicked those who were dead. Uh, okay. Well, she's a witch. She is a witch. And what they said was that they felt like she was pulling memories from their minds to use it against them. Okay. Well, I, you know, I'm still going to stand by my story, but I'm going <laughs> to say again, she's a witch, too. She can do she that. She's a witch. And a she's, ghost. She's now, a witch. A ghost witch. Ghost witch. Yeah. That's easy for them. 
<laughs> that's that's like first week at Hogwarts, yeah. is it not? Yeah, yeah. Pulling memories out. You know, they stick the little yeah. thing in their head and pull out a little droplet of a memory. <sighs> Easy. The wand, man. Yeah, and then they, they put it the in wand, this little yeah. bathtub Vile. and it shows you what's going on. Easy. Oh, you're talking about the uh, the, uh shoot. What's it called? The, oh, I uh, know. I actually know what this is called. The pen. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> Could be, Nick. Very well could be. Listen, hey, we don't know. We're still trying to solve this case. First year Hogwarts. Easy. (laughs) Well, and it talked about, Mm -hmm. it was uh, conversing with them, taunting them. And at this point, it's starting to torment. Mm. Um, And I'm trying to see, is this in the next segment or did we talk about this one? Hold on. I got a thought process, but I don't want to give it away if I don't. Uh, I I probably derailed you with my story there. So sorry about that. Let me tell you, it added some to the depth of my story. Nick, what are you talking about? <laughs> You're rewriting furiously right now. <laughs> I am. I'm like, man, I kind of like this a little bit. Uh, I don't think we've talked about it yet. So I'm going to hold that thought for now. Hmm. Um, let me look through my notes and make sure I didn't miss anything else in my notes. Uh It's now speaking very intelligently. That happened in infield Polter guys. We saw yeah. that at infield. Uh, mimic ability, the entity's uncanny ability to mimic voices known to the family, adding the terror. It identified itself as old Kate. I find it okay. interesting. It called itself old Kate. Yeah. What? Well, um, yeah. See that, that is weird. Cause in a lot of the texts that people wrote about it, they called them old whoever and old this and old that. I doubt they called themselves old. Vengeful intent. The voice expressed a desire of vengeance and torment. Hmm. Again, through John and Betsy, which fits your story and narrative. Right. She wouldn't say why, I guess, or lied about it a lot, I think you said. Well, and here's the thing. It was started contradicting itself. Right. Which one of those entities is known as a mimic, and mm-hmm. that's what it does also. Jeff did that also, if you recall. Correct, which was my yeah. other point. Yeah. He had a variety of origin stories, just like the Joker we talked about. Exactly. See, that's mm-hmm. what reminded me of this story, is the yeah. fact that it wouldn't shut up. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Jeff and and old Kate. Well, I, okay. I'm only sorry to Jeff. Old Kate's nasty. <laughs> we haven't got to the nasty part yet. We're coming. Oh uh, boy! <laughs> and the second part is that it was mimicking other things, which was very interesting. Mm. That's spooky. And that the would intent. Scare me. Oh, for sure. I mean, that was one of the notes I've got here. One of the notes that I wrote is the voice became a constant, unescapable element Mm -hmm. that at this point is causing psychological distress and fear. I I can totally see that. Like all joking aside, that would be very disturbing, especially if it was dead people that you cared about or, you know, it was the voices of people you missed, but you hadn't seen in a long time. That's scary. Well, and we, we've not even talked about this, right? John is starting to get sick. And at this point, mm. it's, it's, it's staking claim in that. Yeah. Which is, again, very interesting. Now, in the next segment, we're going to talk about the famous person that oh, acknowledges. Yeah. Huh, I'm like a goldfish. I forgot about that already. <laughs> 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 yes, the famous person, and it breaks down a little bit more of the story. Do you want to continue okay. on to the next yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, I do. As the haunting of the Bell family grew in both intensity and strangeness, it could no longer be contained within the walls of their farm. Word began to spread, whispers of the unexplainable events seeping into the community like a slow-moving fog. What had started as a private terror was now becoming a public enigma. Neighbors, initially skeptical, began to take notice. 
Reports of the mysterious voice, the physical interactions, and the strange occurrences at the Bell Farm piqued the interest of the surrounding community. Curiosity turned into concern and soon into a kind of fearful fascination. People from near and far started visiting the Bell Farm, each eager to witness the phenomena for themselves. They came with a mix of skepticism and belief, but many left with a sense of unease, having experienced firsthand the unsettling events that had tormented the Bells. Among the visitors was a figure of considerable repute, General Andrew Jackson, a hero of the War of 1812 and a future President of the United States. Legend has it that Jackson, intrigued and somewhat skeptical, ventured to the Bell Farm with a team. His encounter with the supernatural entity is shrouded in myth. It is said that upon approaching the farm, his wagon inexplicably halted, as if an invisible force barred his way. Jackson purportedly exclaimed, by the eternal boys, it is the Bell Witch. Even Jackson, a man of war and politics, was not immune to the strange influence of the Bell Witch. He and his entourage are said to have experienced a series of bizarre occurrences during their stay, solidifying the legend of the haunting in the minds of the public. The Bell Witch haunting had transcended the confines of a family's struggle, becoming a phenomenon that captured the imagination and fear of people far and wide. It was no longer a story whispered in hushed tones, it was a saga discussed openly in the community, a mystery that challenged the beliefs of all who heard it. That's pretty famous. That's pretty famous. <laughs> Is that who you thought it was? I well, t- I'll be completely straight up with you. I don't know many famous people from the 1800s, <laughs> uh, so I had no idea. I knew it that wasn't a Kardashian. That one has to be up there. <laughs> Definitely not a Kardashian, though they are probably vampires. Yeah, probably. They probably so. have lived. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> we're, it'd be like the equivalent of today saying, "Man, my house is haunted." And the president of the United States walks in and is like, yep, yeah. this is definitely haunted. Yeah. Uh, would you mind coming over, Mr. Biden? <laughs> He's like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Sure, I'll bring over my buggy, which he probably has. And uh, Oh, I'm sure. And, well, here's the other childhood. thing, too. Just like Jeff, this one doesn't care who it talks to. So he was, it was talking to him. It was talking to everyone who showed up. Just like Jeff, but mean. Just like Jeff. Because it was legit talking to everybody. Yeah. I can see why you made parallels with these two stories. Very similar. Because this is one of those ones that just doesn't care. Correct. It was legit. We did Nix and then we got done. And I'm like, I know this story, but it's a witch versus a freaking mongoose. Yeah. Well, so I'm like, we got to do it. He could have been a witch. Mongoose could have lied. Yeah. Could have been a witch. I think. There were a lot of stories where witches had um, little mongoose-like familiars, so maybe they're in cahoots. <laughs> they could be. It's like the owl with everything else, Nick. Right, Instead of right. In the witches' community, it's a freaking mongoose. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I find it, it crazy. I find it crazy when I look at this, right? Mm-hmm. Just like with Jeff. The neighbors start hearing. And again, we talked about it in the very beginning. The yeah. community was not real big, right? Right. But word's getting out. And I'm guessing it's one of them kids is at school and they're like, man, the bell wish was leaving me awake all last night. So I couldn't do this test today, teacher. And the teacher's like, <laughs> smack, because that's what they did back then. Yeah. But then the other kids are like, man, he got smacked up. I wonder what happened. And then the whole, the whole bell witch thing came out. Yep. Then they tell their parents and they're like, Hey, I heard you had a witch over here. What's going on? And witch like, I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> you can talk right to here me the whole time. <laughs> Speaking of which, you want to talk to your dead great, 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 great grandma. Speaking here of which, want to talk Hi. to a witch? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, how crazy is that? So the neighbors yeah. start talking about it. The neighbors start yeah. seeing it. The neighbors start having a story. Mm-hmm. And now everyone else is coming in to the point to where General Andrew Jackson. Right. He wasn't just going through town. He was going there to figure this out. Yeah. And so, and I don't think we know the answer to this because I also know the story. Mm-hmm. Was it rude to everyone or just rude to its targets? Uh, here's what's weird is it wasn't yeah. always rude. Right. Right. Was it always rude to its people that it hated or? No. Weird. Weird. 
which is very weird. Yeah. Uh, it also provided some info, which helped the family occasionally. Really? But here's my thought process. Okay. Similar to Jeff, the talking mongoose. Mm-hmm. It provided things when it benefited with them knowing. Right. So, again, help. correct. Mm. Correct. I think that's what it is. But, yeah, some of the, the things that they would say, it was literally to help the family out. It wasn't to hurt the family. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, Yeah, what's an example? Here. I'm looking now. Because I've got some notes here. I think I've got a little bit further in, so I'm trying to see if there's anything I can give you without giving away something. Uh, right. Uh, can't talk about that one yet. Uh, so it was providing some prophecies and predictions of future events that did occur that helped the family ahead of time. Mm. So that was one of them. Um, and it said some of which... Uh, added to the mystique, but they did come true. So it wasn't just the giving prophecy. The prophecy was coming true. Okay. Revelation of secrets. So it was revealing secrets and private conversation of families and others. Is that the benefit of the family? Oh, it was helpful. It benefited okay. the family. Interesting. So all the people that was coming in, similar to Jeff, the mongoose, hmm. let's say a neighbor had an issue with the bells. Right. When they would leave, it'd be like, hey, you know, X, Y, and Z. Mm. So it was benefiting. Um, it was a gossip bag. Kind of was. Yeah, but so was Jeff is, the Mongoose. Jeff Tonga Mongoose. Very yeah, simply. He was nice, though. This is this is a witch. Uh, I think that's the biggest ones I can tell without going okay. into something else that's coming up. Well, that, that could be like, I'll help you so that. The main harm comes from me and not from others. Like I'm preserving you to harm you. I think it also can lead. Like I truly believe Mm -hmm. that when we're walking down the path of life, Mm -hmm. some of these entities might have an idea of where there's a fork in the road. Right. And they provide the path they want you to take based on, hey, I wouldn't go this way when this one thing occurs. Because if you do, you're going to get hurt. And it could be the safer way. And it's, right. it's a trickster. He, I got a sort of like a little story about that. And it's going to reveal how nerdy mm-hmm. I am. But there's a role <laughs> okay. playing game called uh, Mage the Ascension. Have you ever heard of that? Mm-mm. I know that I know the name of the game, but I don't know anything yeah. about it. Yeah. It's the same people who make Vampire the Masquerade and Werewolf the Apocalypse. Well, anyway, how magic works in that world is if they do something that's too far against the laws of reality, they'll get hurt uh-huh. because they get something called paradox. So there's a group of mages or wizards that what they do is they can read what's going to happen to you 600 actions later. So if they want to kill you, what they might do is when you're crossing the street, they'll bump into you, delay you two steps. And those two steps later on in your day would be the two steps you took to avoid a brick falling off a building and killing you. Oh, but they took those two steps away and killed you like that. So that sort of yeah, is like that what you're talking would about. Fit. That's very much exactly what I'm talking about. Right. And I, it doesn't say that explicitly when I research this. Yeah. But that's the first thing that came to my mind is I, I think bet that's that it real led logical. them astray. Real logic. Yeah. I mean, think about it. It's already getting caught in some contradictory things. Yeah. Which tells me it's already trying to trick them a little bit. Yeah. Plus, knowing that the neighbors are talking about you could be true. You might think it helps you. Doesn't make you feel very good about who's around you, though. Correct. Yeah. Because it gives you... um if anything, more of a hatred. Yeah, the truth is not helpful sometimes. That is also true. Yeah. The truth is not always beneficial right. against popular belief. Exactly. There there are times where lies are kinder. Correct, 100%. 100%. Yeah. Now, this next segment mm-hmm. goes into some of what we've been talking about. Okay. 
but it adds a few things more to it, which makes you go, why did it do that for? Hmm. Are you ready to hear what that is? Yeah, let's hear that. That's interesting. Within the web of eerie occurrences surrounding the Bell family, the motivations and actions of the entity known as the Bell Witch remained a central, mysterious piece. This ghostly presence, having revealed itself not only through physical disturbances, but through a chilling voice, seemed to harbor a specific and malevolent intent, especially towards certain members of the Bell family. The witch's primary target appeared to be John Bell, the family patriarch. Her torment of John was relentless and cruel. She would curse and berate him with her disembodied voice, inflict physical agony, and even claim responsibility for his mysterious illnesses. But what had John Bell done to earn such wrath? The reasons were as murky as the entity itself, shrouded in allegations and whispers of past misdeeds, none of which could be confirmed. Betsy Bell, the young daughter, also faced the witch's particular ire. The witch's actions towards Betsy were vicious, marked by violent hair pulling, pinching, and slapping. It was as if Betsy bore the brunt of the witch's rage, a focus of her sinister energies. The witch's interference took a more personal turn in the matters of Betsy's heart. Betsy, during the height of the haunting, was engaged to a local boy named Joshua Gardner. This engagement, however, seemed to infuriate the witch. She would relentlessly taunt and terrorize Betsy about her relationship, urging her to end the engagement. The witch's voice would echo through the bell home, casting disparaging remarks and ominous warnings, making life unbearable for the young couple. The reasons behind the witch's actions and her interest in Betsy's engagement were as mysterious as her origin. Some speculated that the witch was acting out of jealousy or a twisted sense of protectiveness over Betsy. Others wondered if there was something about Joshua Gardner that the witch found objectionable or threatening to her unseen agenda. That last sound effect when we come into this is so creepy to me, but I, I love it. I know. The drone that's through a lot of this too is really making my heart pound. I like that. Yeah. I've, I've, yeah, I've tried to add drones to it a lot more to these spooky things because I think it adds to it. It's spooktacular. <laughs> so this one, now we've got a whole new level to this entire thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. I got to bring this out right away. Sure. How old once again was Betsy? <laughs> when when the engagement thing happened yes here's the thing and you got to remember this back uh -huh. then very different time frame very yep. different yep <laughs> now she was 11 i think when we talked originally right right when it started yeah uh when was betsy uh, or how old is what I should put. How old was Betsy when it was engagement? That's not something I researched, but I'm thinking she was probably 13, 12 or 13. Yeah, that's what I'm speculating and I don't like it. <laughs> uh, she would have been approximately 15 years old at the time of her engagement. Okay. Well, I guess that's a little bit better. Um, I could see. It, I assume much younger. Yeah, if, I mean, the witch might have been like, I hate her, but this is a little messed up even for me, <laughs> kind of thing. But but my theory is why she didn't like it is because she wanted to torment John and Betsy both, and she could only choose one location. Well, back then, they may have stayed with the family, though, so they would have potentially Maybe. had one more person in the house. Or they may have taken her to his parents' house, which I think might have been more common. Could be. You might be right yeah. on that. I'm not actually sure on I, that. That's very I, I possible. I don't think it grew a conscience. No. No. Honestly, mm -hmm. the way I thought about this is I thought maybe he knew something or could have discerned something mm. that would have hurt the situation. Right. Maybe he was particularly righteous and religious and... I mean, despite marrying little girls, but, uh, and that spooked her. <laughs> Very valid. Listen, it's all valid. Yeah. Well, we can't. There's know. a lot of, 
we we both agreed it's not for any good reasons. No, absolutely no. not. There was definitely something there, and yeah. and it goes back to another thing that happened at the very beginning of this mm-hmm. this section. It was making sure that of all of them, it was pointing to John going, I'm doing this to you. Mm. You know, and there's nothing you can do about it. Think about that. There's right. nothing you can do. I'm going to progressively make this worse for you day after day after mm-hmm. day, mm-hmm. which makes me think that this, in this case, which as we're saying, is trying to oppress him at this point. Right. Because there's something psychologically that occurs when you believe there's nothing you can do, you're just going to lose day after day after day. Oh, yeah. It, you know, there's an experiment that was done that shows this in animals. Oh, really? It's, yeah. So what they did is they have a mouse and they drop it into a bucket of water. And the mouse will swim and swim and swim. But eventually, and it usually takes like an under an hour or whatever, mm-hmm. that mouse will start to drown. Okay. Oh, wow. But if they pull it out of the water right before it dies, let it come to and that kind of thing, and then throw it mm-hmm. back in the water, it now believes that there's a chance that something could pull it out of the water again. And do you know how long it can swim after that? Two hours. Almost 24 hours. Holy smokes. That's crazy. That's the difference between being oppressed and being normal. If you have hope for a situation, you can do more. And this is in animals. Think how much with our thought processes, it affects our day-to-day lives. Which makes it, you know, I put in my notes a theory that I've got, and this follows the infield a lot for the most part, Mm. but it's like it's got a couple more tricks up its its sleeve. Yeah. The big thing that that I put in my notes here Mm -hmm. was at this point, not only is it is it giving John a hard time, it's cursing him nonstop. Yeah. yeah. Right? When we talk about, especially in domestic situations, typically the man will berate and curse and belittle the female to the point to where they don't feel like they have a worth. Right. The strongest person in this household is John. Mm-hmm. You collapse John. You got the entire household. Yeah. Yes. So the way I looked at this is an entity's going after the head of the household, Mm -hmm. the youngest daughter, which Mm. is the person you try to protect as a dad. Right. Which is doing what? It's oppressing to him. Correct. That's Mm. my point. It's not that they were trying to be difficult with Betsy. They're trying to break John's spirit is what it's trying to do. Mm. Because the one thing you're going to protect with the exception of your wife is your daughters. Yeah. This is the first daughter. And it's like, let me make his life a little bit worse. So Mm. she unfortunately is just an innocent bystander. She just happened to be hundred percent. Yeah. So the target was never really Betsy. Uh, we, it was got, John. we got two competing theories now. I think yours is probably mm-hmm. more realistic, but mine's more cinematic. <laughs> hey, man, hey, I'm with you on this. Yeah, I'm making the Nick cinematic universe, and this is the first story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I put in this one. I've got some interesting notes. Y'all have no clue. I got some of the dumbest things, and you'll I scratch theories out or I erase them. And it's kind of crazy. The witch often spoke of a vendetta or a mission to torment the family. Mm. In addition to that, particularly John and Betsy, through reasons of this vendetta, was often contradictory right. or unclear. So again, in the beginning, the witch is like, I choose you and I choose you. Mm-hmm. But when they would start pushing, they would always go back to John. Yeah. Every time, go back to John. 
And I think, again, it was just trying to mimic, deceive, trick. Mm -hmm. And typically one thing always falls in the same rules is how I put it. Yeah. So not surprising there. Um, The next one is kind of a big one is how I put it. Are you ready to hear what happens next? Oh, I hope it's not going to be a jump scare. (laughs) (laughs) I'm ready. Let's do it. As the haunting of the Bell Witch continued, a dark chapter was about to unfold. The once sturdy farmer started to experience episodes of strange and debilitating ailments. His body would seize up, rendering him unable to speak or move. His face would contort in pain, his eyes reflecting a deep, unspoken terror. The witch, with her sinister voice, claimed responsibility for these afflictions, taunting John and his family, boasting of her control over his well-being. The situation grew worse as the year 1820 approached. John's health deteriorated rapidly, his once powerful frame becoming frail and weak. The family watched in despair as the man who had been their pillar of strength was reduced to a shadow of his former self. In December of 1820, the final blow came. John Bell was found in a state of delirium, his body failing, unable to recover. Despite the family's desperate efforts to save him, John Bell passed away, leaving the family not only in grief but in a state of bewilderment and fear. After his death, a mysterious vial of unknown liquid was discovered in the house. The witch's voice, ever present, claimed that it was her potion that had ended John Bell's life. When a drop of the liquid was tested on a cat, the animal reportedly died instantly, adding a chilling credence to the witch's claim. John Bell's death marked a turning point in the haunting. It was no longer just a series of unexplained occurrences and torment. It had claimed a life. The witch had demonstrated a terrifying level of influence and power, one that could reach beyond this realm and result in very real, very fatal consequences. The death of John Bell left the family and community in shock. The man who had moved to Tennessee seeking a new life had instead found himself the target of a relentless, inexplicable force. His passing under such mysterious circumstances only deepened the legend of the Bell Witch, a legend that continues to evoke fear and curiosity to this day. That's what I was talking about in the first segment. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too. Yeah, yeah. So that's probably the the biggest yeah. takeaway from this entire story, obviously. So I had always heard it that this is mm-hmm. the only story that was recorded where a ghost supposedly took someone's life in North America. But you said you you know of other ones. Um, people dying this way, that's probably correct. Mm. And I can't get into the other ways for good reason. Okay. I don't think our podcasts and or YouTube would appreciate us taking the other scope. Uh, Okay. Well, y'all can look it up yourselves, but, uh. In North America, this is incredibly rare. In Asia, this is like, ghost will always kill you. Like, they yes. do not give a flying flipperty do. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> They'll get you. Well, and I think probably the most famous story besides... Um, Besides, uh, this one is the, uh, shoot, they made a conjuring on it, uh, or not a conjuring, a, uh, ghost movie on it. The heck, uh, we talked about it. Um, the exorcism of Emily Rose. Oh, that that was the other one where she died. But yeah, we wouldn't call that a ghost necessarily, would we? I wouldn't call this a ghost. Hmm. Yeah, I guess that depends on where you land on it. Because a lot of people consider this a ghost, and that's why they say that in North America. Tidbit. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I guess think it about depends it. Depends on where you where you believe on this. 
Well, we really only have a few options based on what's mm. there. I don't believe it's a ghost at all. Okay. Second one's a witch. Could be a witch. Mm. We don't have proof otherwise that it is right. or it's not a witch. Yeah. Or a ghost but witch. When we start talking or a ghost witch. Correct. Right. Or we could be talking about a demon. Mm-hmm. Which has we're talking a ton about of characteristics about that. Oppression, depression, mm-hmm. it's tormenting, and I think it's trying to give itself power. Right. Oh, I should say, this is sort of on a tangent, but I want to say it before I forget. Do you remember mm-hmm. one of the other kids was having the same symptoms that John was before? Yes. I feel like it was testing out its potion or poison on that kid before the grand finale with John. Absolutely could be. Yeah. Absolutely could be. But you got to remember, he was already getting sick a while ago. So my question mm. would be, had it been poisoning them, him this entire time? And again, we talk about this from a religious standpoint in other categories. We say... Mm. God doesn't have to do miracles. He can use the things around him. Right. Who's to say that a demon isn't using the same? It's not like God can't use magic and neither will a demon. Right. Or a demon will, I guess, in this case. Mm -hmm. Who's to say that a demon can't use the same thing or or Mm -hmm. possess somebody to where they don't remember doing the same things? That's true. Also, Also, I've heard another version of this particular spot. Um, mm-hmm. that John had a medication that he took anyway, and this thing swapped him. Oh, in in the cabinet with a poison and this medication. So that's interesting. Yeah. I did not hear that. I did not know that. That's the one I had heard before, but I, I like this version better mm-hmm. because it's more of an active agent on the entity's part. So I like makes it this sense. way better. I also looked up while we was talking, are there mm-hmm. any additional cases that does not revolve around the thing that I'm talking about? Right. In North America, throughout North America. And it says, it's not the only story of this kind, though North American folklore often varies legends and tales where supernatural entities are forced or believed to have caused harm or death. A few examples include North American folklore. A lot of times these stories vary widely among different tribes and often serve as a cautionary tale or an explanation of uh, unexplained events. The second one, the legend of La La uh, La Llorona. Ah, they made a movie about that recently. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a well-known... Hispanic legend. Yeah, by recently, I mean anywhere in the last five years. I have a bad track of time when it comes to that stuff. I think it's uh, maybe seven years ago, six, oh, seven okay. years ago, probably. In, any time in my lifetime could be recently. I'll have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it says there are numerous haunted locations across North America where death and tragedies have been attributed to physical activity. Mm. Uh, including the paranormal. This includes certain historical buildings, old hotels, battlefields mm-hmm. where spirits are said to linger. And of course it puts in their urban legends too. Yeah. Um, which I didn't know about the, the La Llorona. I thought that was, I didn't think that was here in the States. Was that here in the States? I didn't think so. Um, also, I don't know the story of it cause I never saw that movie, but that movie is really good. Is it? I'll have to check that out. I thought so. It was one of my favorites because uh, it was part of that Conjuring story. I can't hear the name of that movie without thinking My Sharona. You know that old song? <laughs> my Sharona. My Larona. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're getting, we're getting a copyright strike because that was so uh, like the song. That was pretty close. <laughs> Says the tales with the origins in Mexico and American Southwest. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. I've heard in the in the in the Southwest U.S. they like a lot of uh, Mexican things. 
Well, it says, according to the legend, she roams near rivers, lakes, and other bodies of water, mm. wailing for her lost children and sometimes causing misfortune to those who see her. Oh, yeah. It's like a North American or an American banshee. Kind of. Kind of. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. Now, the big thing is, and I kind of felt sorry for this cat. They're like, hey, let's see if this oh, is poison. Yeah. <laughs> they should give it to uh, the cat. I'm glad you brought that up because I think that they deserve whatever they got now. I was like, gosh, dang, you savages, man. Do that to a cat. You've got, like, go grab a squirrel or something. I don't know. <laughs> exactly. Like, you know, I find it interesting, though. John dies. And mm-hmm. then it's like, hey, see that vial over there? I did that. Yeah. I have a theory behind that, but we can't cover it just yet because uh, the next segment kind of provides where my mind goes on this. And I'm going to see uh, if your mind goes the same way. A little more context into this. Not necessarily more t- context, but I want you to notice the events of what occurs after. Okay. You ready to hear that part, Nick? I sure am. In the wake of John Bell's mysterious death, a subtle yet perceptible change came over the Bell farm. The intense haunting that had gripped the family for so many years began to wane. The malicious voice of the witch, once a constant and terrifying presence, grew quieter, its echoes fading into the background of their lives. The physical manifestations, the unexplained noises, and the apparitions that had tormented the Bells for so long gradually dissipated. It was as if, with John Bell's passing, the witch's purpose had been fulfilled, her vendetta satisfied. During this time, Betsy Bell, who had borne the brunt of much of the witch's wrath, faced a crucial decision in her life. Still reeling from the loss of her father and the years of torment, Betsy made the heart-wrenching choice to call off her engagement to Joshua Gardner. The witch had vehemently opposed this union, and though it's unclear how much this influenced Betsy's decision, it was a poignant reminder of the impact the haunting had on her personal life. Betsy's life, in the years following the cessation of the haunting, took a turn towards normalcy, a life once thought impossible during the height of the supernatural disturbances. She eventually married Richard Powell, a school teacher who had shown interest in her before her engagement to Joshua Gardner. The Bell Witch's haunting left an indelible mark on Betsy, as it did on the entire Bell family. The experiences they endured were not easily forgotten, lingering like shadows in the corners of their memories. Yet, in time, they found a way to move forward, to rebuild their lives from the ashes of their inexplicable ordeal. Some twist for Betsy there. (laughs) What was your takeaway from that, Nick? I want to see if we're on the same uh, wavelength here. Well, I found it particularly shocking that this school teacher, before she became engaged to this other guy, had shown interest. And I don't know what the connection I'm making here is, but the Bell Witch was vehemently against the engagement. After the father dies, she breaks off the engagement and goes with this person who had shown interest before. So there's some kind of connection there, I feel like, but I don't know where to take it. That's not the direction I was going, but you're correct. I thought all those things too. Here is something that I found interesting. Mm -hmm. Of course, back then, there was always suitors, Mm. you know, almost not arranged marriages, but it's kind of like, I had wondered if there was some pressure. That's what I was curious about, too. Yeah. What I was leaning towards is after John died, what happened? Well, she broke it off. Everything calmed down. No, I mean, just period. Here's my theory. Mm -hmm. Demon comes along, has been poisoning John for a while, tormenting him. Telling him everything going on, right? right? Is making itself known. It's starting to go after Betsy, which causes John more torment. I believe it overstepped a little too far and killed him off. 
The problem with that is now the demon has no power because it oppressed and depressed the main person, right. but hasn't worked on somebody else. Mm. So now the voice of this demon is getting softer and softer because there's yeah. no oppression or depression there. Ah, now the other going. takeaway is unlike infield where we was like, it's poltergeist kind of activity because the age Technically, Betsy would still be there, but she's kind of strong-willed. Mm. She's at this point annoyed, and it's, she's not really allowing this thing to kind of dictate her life. So she's not oppressed, depressed, or any of that. Yeah, it, neither it was is anyone else in the too family. Much on the father. Now it's screwed up. I don't want to use any particular words here, and maybe you were insinuating this, but maybe the father chose to drink that vial. And the witch hadn't expected that she'd pushed him that far. And she was planning to work on everyone else, but never planned on him dying at all. He did that. See, that I didn't think of that side. Yeah, I mean, that yeah. would make sense. What I was thinking was she was working on the patriarch to then right. potentially start kind of pushing into other people. Mm -hmm. But when he died, she's like, well. Didn't see that coming. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm I'm on the same page as you, except I think he chose to do that. And then the hero route. Yeah. And then afterwards, she's like starting to fade already. So in a desperate attempt to, you know, re regain some mana, she's like, oh, I did that. No, you didn't do that at all. Man. Sounds just like Bruce Willis in Armageddon. Oh. I need you down there with my baby girl. Yeah. I need you to take care of my baby girl for me. I'm going to go blow up on this comet. Yeah. <laughs> He's the hero now. He's Just, a hero. He's despite like, the story Bruce I told Willis. earlier. <laughs> exactly. Man, we turned him from a super villain to a super to a hero. superhero in an hour. That's crazy. <laughs> We're full of surprises. That's why. That's why you always got to watch. We the really end. are. <laughs> I do think it's interesting, though, because you know as well as I do, a demon's not going to try to lose its grasp. Right. I think it overstepped or something yeah. happened. Yeah. And it was not ready for that. Something out of its plan entirely. Yeah. I think it Correct. just took credit for it, too. I don't think it actually meant to do that. I don't believe it did either. Mm. I think that was a big mistake. Bell Witch, you are a dummy. <laughs> Yeah, you screwed up. You screwed up. I could do better I found that than part, that. <laughs> <laughs> I found that part really interesting because I'm yeah. like, that's kind of wild that it goes through all that trouble and torment of two people. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, when John left, it didn't have any power anymore. So right. it was it was feeding off of his energy. Yeah. I, I totally believe it had further plans, but it never got to implement it. Correct. That's what I believe, too. Because mm -hmm. the other two younger ones, it was probably waiting for them to get a little aged to then feed yeah. off of that power, too. But they didn't quite get there. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. I, I'm glad you separated out this segment. And I also do think there's something to it that her engagement was sort of mildly arranged at best at worst it well, might and be fully arranged from the research that i've done the only thing that kind of plays into that which is somewhat interesting was they said that of all the children obviously she was the one that typically the males would come and be like staking claim hmm. so to speak and there was only two guys that staked any kind of claim the first one being the one that the bell witch did not like right the other guy had an interest, but, and it didn't say this, this is me assuming, it gave the indication that he was significantly older. Mm. Both of these guys are too old for her. And I want to make it clear yes. that anyone listening to this, you cannot do this. You can't do this. They can't R. Kelly yeah. people nowadays. Yeah, Good night. Ave. R. <laughs> Kelly can't R. Kelly people. <laughs> exactly. And for all you wonderful people out there, there's only one more segment left. We're going to try to keep this as a one-parter. Is that yeah. right, Nick? Yeah, we're doing you guys a favor this time. 
doing you guys a favor this time. We've done too many two parters. This is two one parters in a row. Yeah. But are you ready to listen to the last segment? Wrap this thing up, I, Nick. I sure am. I am. <laughs> As the echoes of the Bell Witch haunting faded into history, its legacy continued to grow, evolving into a cornerstone of Southern folklore and American paranormal lore. The story of the Bell family and the malevolent entity known as the Bell Witch has transcended the bounds of a simple ghost tale, embedding itself into the cultural fabric and igniting the imaginations of generations. Over the years, the Bell Witch story has been the subject of countless retellings. It has inspired books, movies, and documentaries, each attempting to capture the essence of this haunting mystery. The farm in Adams, Tennessee, where the Bell family once lived, has become a place of pilgrimage for those fascinated by the supernatural, a tangible link to a story that blurs the line between history and legend. The theories about what happened to the Bell family in the early 19th century are as varied as they are intriguing. Skeptics have proposed explanations rooted in the natural world, from mass hysteria, a result of the stresses of frontier life, to the possibility of a cleverly orchestrated hoax by someone within or close to the family. Others lean towards explanations of a paranormal nature. These theories range from the presence of a malevolent spirit, a poltergeist, to the idea of a curse placed upon the family for reasons lost to time. Some even speculate about the involvement of witchcraft, a vendetta carried out by a human practicing dark arts. Yet, despite the numerous theories and investigations, the truth behind the bell witch haunting remains elusive, shrouded in mystery. It is a tale that continues to challenge our understanding of the world, a story that defies easy explanation. Hmm. What do you think of them theories, Nick? Uh, I mean, I'm still going with my original ghost witch, but I think I would have added demon to that list. But when you say entity, yep. it could be no one too. says no one says demon on this. Yeah, of they, the big cases, they know. You know what's odd about this one? They never ever call in the church. Every other well, story, they always 1800s. do. 1800s. Yeah, there was we're talking. Yeah, but my guess is it was significantly different than what Mm. we think of when we think of churches. Uh, It could be. You know, it's like uh, back then it was Bill. (laughs) Bill was given a sermon for the week. You know what I mean? Yeah. Actually, maybe the church house and the schoolhouse were all one thing, and it was just the teacher there probably or something like Like that. Like Little House on the Prairie. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it could have been something like Uh, that. Well, and you know, here's the thing. It's, you know, when we're talking about the time frame of all of this, mm. we're talking so early in history that, like, I don't think there was a lot of li- rhyme and reasons. There may not have even been a church because oh, a lot of times the households would have handled a lot of this. Yeah. You know, back then, and you got to remember, it said it was a very small community. You know, what was the size of the community? 10 people? Yeah. You know, 15 people, maybe? It, it makes you know, me it's think a little the, bit different. The movie The Witch, where uh, they were a very religious household, but they were kind of hesitant to take things to their church elders because saying yeah. something like that made them seem unholy and unclean. So they were kind of like, you better watch out for this. Well, and in this case, I mean, everyone ended up knowing. I mean, Andrew Jackson yeah. was there. Yeah. If it but got we're to the talking, president, it would have got to everyone, I guess. Right. But think about it. Like, we're not talking like 1890s. Like, we're talking yeah. 1810s. Right. A big chunk of this happened in like 18, uh, 17, 18, 18, 18, 19, 18, 20 through mm. 23. I think now what's crazy is they say there's still activity to today. That is crazy. Um, There's still some paranormal activity that occurs on that property. Mm. But in addition to that, there's also uh, the bell, Witch cave, which is near the property that they say you can hear a voice of an entity inside and it will talk to people. I wonder if they're thinking it retreated to that cave. At that time, a lot of people say that they believe it 
or the origin was in the cave. Oh, interesting. But that it was mad because they were on the property that the mm. cave was on. And they, they saw it. The original story is they saw it at, or she saw it as in they're stealing her land. Right. Because okay. the cave's not very far. It's like 800 feet or something. Like it's not very far. I wonder how, how much of that cave's been explored. I wonder if there's something weird in there. I don't know. That oh, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. That's where I want to go. Although there's probably, <laughs> probably some creepy crawlies in there. I'm more scared of that stuff than ghosts. Oh, for sure. Now you knew the Bell Witch. Did you know a lot of this? A little bit of this? How much I, of this I knew did you know? Quite a bit of it, but of course every telling is a little different. Like I mentioned, the um the poisoning in the stories that mm-hmm. I had heard was more like someone swapping medication. Um Yeah, which is interesting. Yeah. Which for I think sure. that's something that could happen real easy or even accidentally. And I think some people framed it like from a semi-skeptic point of view that he might have mixed up his own medications. Um, Which is possible. Uh, it's possible, but I like sort of like the theory that we came through it. Um, also, I don't know if I knew there were so many kids in the story because they're not really mentioned that much. They don't talk about the other kids a whole lot. Yeah. And I think it was because the ones are so much older mm-hmm. that it didn't matter. And the younger ones are so young, even yeah. for the demon, it didn't matter. Right. It was Betsy and John. Yeah. Because even the wife got kind of a free pass. Yeah. Yeah, really. Not much about that at all. Um, No, she didn't get a whole lot. Yeah. So I can see why I wouldn't know much about them. But yeah, I've heard quite a bit about this. Um, Does The thing I found fascinating Mm -hmm. was that Andrew Jackson knew who she was before he got there. I never She was already legend there. That's fantastic. Yeah. Like that's a whole Which is interesting thing. because even he proclaimed, clearly this is the Bell Witch. So he yeah. knew of the legend, mm-hmm. which is in and of itself is amazing, right? He yeah. knew the legend before even stepping foot on the property. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it spread far and wide. That's pretty clear. Yes. Um, the Correct. last segment made me want to ask you a question. Because one of the theories mm-hmm. that we don't really prescribe to is that it's like some kind of dark like dark magic person like doing this or something like that do you think uh it's in the realm of possibility that people can do spells and that kind of stuff to harm other people like can people wield magic i believe that they do but it's in a different facet okay so a prime example anytime that you look at a call witchcraft voodoo they all do what they call on the spirits right. and elements from the other side. So they're right. using a demon as a conduit. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I heard a very, I heard a very interesting thing. I probably shouldn't have read it, but I'm super curious. Mm-hmm. There was a guy that was a part of, he's a warlock. Right. I think that's what they call him. Like a today warlock. Yeah. Like he's today. And someone asked him a question. Does it ever scare you that you're dealing with what could be prescribed as a demon or an entity like that? And he goes, not if you know what you're dealing with, but don't ever call on something. He said, because a lot of times they come back for favors. Mm. It's like the mafia. So kind of, that's very much so. Yeah. And, uh, he even made it clear that as long as you put the boundaries there to where you explain, he goes, but sometimes there's a benefit in helping them. Hmm. So I think that there is, there's actually a really famous story of a radio producer that went on a date with a lady and they both had this thing for Egyptian history. Mm Mm-hmm. She was significantly older than him is what the story was. This is like a, like a very famous radio disc jockey. Right. He saw it as platonic. She did not. Okay. And when she was like, Hey, why don't we kind of come over to my house? Now he's like, nah, like I'm good. Like this is a platonic thing. And Mm. she got torqued off. Oh yeah. And she put spells on him. He was a skeptic, didn't believe in any of it. 
in the first few nights, he saw shadow people. Mm. And it got to the point to where he died also. He died. They found him in the bathtub with candles around the tub. They had all been lit and had melted down to almost the bottom. The reason they found him was because he didn't show up to work for three days. Mm. And when they figured out basically through uh, the coroner what happened, they said he had a coronary um, to where he basically just had a heart attack and died. Mm. And the days that led up to it, one of his friends reached out to him and was like, hey, you know, I know there's a lot of stuff. You kind of hit me up on this. What's going on? He had just went and bought a bunch of Bibles, salt. He was putting salt mm. around the corners of his house, the doorways and stuff like that. Put crosses up. Uh, did every different kind of religion to stop it. And they said that he also died from it. Mm. But that was technically a case of a witch. Okay. Okay. Don't uh and what sh- don't date ladies into Egyptology. No. No. Absolutely not. <laughs> he was apparently into the music. They both okay. had a love for Egyptian stuff. He's yeah. into the music. She was into a little bit of everything. Mm. So, yeah. Out of curiosity, everyone is watching and listening. What's your theories? Do you think this is a witch? Thinks demon? Do you think it's just a ghost, an intelligent ghost? Tell us in the comments down below, no matter where you're listening to our podcast. Also, if you could like, and no matter where you are, definitely give us a rating. We would definitely appreciate that. We can't grow without the help of, obviously, our community. And you guys, you you take care of us. We appreciate that. Yeah. We could always use a little bit more. Just yeah, saying. Yeah. You, you owe us for making this a one-parter. We could have made this two. We could have exactly. done that. Could make it two. We're yeah. at two hours and 20 minutes. We can make this an hour and a half each yeah. or an hour and 10 minutes each. Yeah, we're not going to because we love you. Maybe. In a, in a creepy way. We might change our mind. If this That's is a good. two-parter, we changed our mind. <laughs> <laughs> but until we all see you in the next one, goodbye. See you later. <laughs>